into something that can be legally published. Now, I've done this in part or total three times. Uh, two of them are only available as ebook. And I'm not going to tell you what the source material was. I'll leave you to guess that. <laughs> this one, the first two thirds of the odd number chapters started life as a fanfic. And then sprinkled throughout the material are scenes from another couple of fanfics that were written in the same general, uh, about the same show. What had happened is I was trying to get published for years and having no luck. And finally, I just needed somebody to read my stuff. So I started writing some fanfics, and also the show did something that I didn't like, and I was taking my revenge by creating alternative timelines. <laughs> um, and after I had written that, I kind of looked at it and said, you know, this is a good story. I can't do anything with it because of characters and so forth, but this is a good story. So I took it as a foundation. And I go on it. <clears throat> so, first point you do not own your fanfic. Technically speaking, the studio that puts out the show owns it. Now, that's copyright, the characters are copyrighted, the places are copyrighted, uh, the title is copyrighted. You can be sued. Technically speaking, now you're right, you're safe. In reality, as long as you're not making money from it, you can write all the fanfic you like, because the studio, it's not worth going after you. It's going to cost them more legal fees and the bad PR, because who writes fanfic? The fan base. You piss off your fan base, you lose your fan base. So, for a fun thing, it's nothing to sweat. Um, but when you try to convert it to something that is publishable, that you can make a buck from, that can have your name, your name on it and start to build a career, then you run into the problem. So, what can you do? Uh, I have 2.5 of my novels, as well as some, some short stories, originated as fanfics. And also scattered bits of others. Sometimes I'll be writing along and I'll say, you know, this is like a scene I wrote for that fanfic uh, two years ago. Hey, I can up my word count for the day. Cut, paste, change names, happy. So, you can pull, pull that. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey, which has made oodles of money. It is one of the most bought books, but it was started as a Twilight fanfic. You want to run some substantial changes when you're turning your fanfic. And I like to start with the SNR command. Search and replace. You start off all names. Every name Search and replace it. And don't get cute. Don't use a variant on the name. Use something completely original. This has, you also want to do the same thing for place names, pet names, you know, like, oh, sugar plum. Well, change it to sweet. Read better, anyways. <laughs> um, Basically, anything like that that's identifiable and drawn from the parent material. Search and replace it. This has a couple of different effects. One, it removes the evidence that it was once based on the parent material. It sets in your mind that this is a different piece. When you're reading along and you're, you're not seeing those familiar character names, you will have a mind shift that, yeah, this is unique, this is different. And that will echo out into the editorial changes that you make as you go along. 
Look out for cash raises. You know, if somebody goes, um, I don't know, 23 skidoo, and that's a catch phrase they perpetually use in the show, get rid of it. Put something else there. Um, it will also help change the character's perception by your audience. Because those catch phrases set the tone for that character. And you can set a similar but different tone. So it creates a unique character that you can capitalize on. Change the location if possible. If you're talking about an urban setting, well, New York can become Toronto, can become LA. Most major cities are pretty similar when it comes to day-to-day -day operations. Now, you can't have the uh, UN in Toronto because the UN is in New York. But you can have the uh, an international uh, international association of some kind, an international economic association, make something up that can serve the same purposes. If you have a carrot farm in the parent material, change it to a cucumber farm. Another great thing, if you have pets, change a cat into a dog. Change a lizard into a snake. These little things suddenly transform the piece as a whole. Um, now, what you want is emotional consistency in the reader's response. This goes for all writing. If you are writing fiction, you are playing your audience like a fiddle. Their emotions are the fiddle strings. And you're not appealing to their intellect. You may distract their intellect with facts and good research and so forth, and that's all fine and good. But what you're really doing is playing the emotions, and that's what fiction does. So you want to keep, if it's a great fanfic, you want to try to keep that emotional consistency where you're hitting those same emotional chords as you're going through in the new material. A great thing to do, and I've done this, <coughs> uh, change fantasy into science fiction. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you take something that is set in a show that is today, fine. Turn a subway ride to the suburbs into an intercontinental maglev between continents. Your morning commute is 2,000 kilometers. But since the maglev is moving at 5,000 kilometers per hour, it's not that bad. So when you up a tech level like that, uh, one great example is if you, I had something that was accomplished by magic in the parent series fanfic, I changed it around so that it was accomplished by a drug and shifted the thing over into science fiction from a modern fantasy base. And you need to do a little bit of research, or it required that I look up. Uh, some brain chemicals when I was designing the drug so I could logically say, yes, it increases dopamine, it increases suggestibility through blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's the whole other thing with the techno battle. Make your techno battle realistic. Um, there's nothing worse than somebody, we're inverting the neutron flux <laughs> and changing the polarity of neutrons are neutral by definition. If you have a proton, it is positive, by definition. If you have an electron, it is negative, by definition. Do not have a proton touch an electron. Please, not unless you're blowing something up. So, a spell becomes a drug, 
Or, conversely, a drug becomes a spell. The idea is to change your setting in substantial ways that still allow you to tell the story. Now, some stories can't be told this way. Some stories are set in a time and place. And that will only really work. Unless you want to do some real gymnastics, somebody running around with a steel sword, hacking people up, isn't going to work if you also have advanced firearms. Ah, but it wasn't a steel sword. They stepped away from that. Except they also had vibro blades, which were technically vibranium, which is like steel, but different. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you can use excuses, uh, explanations. I won't call them excuses, because I use them myself. Um, in this one, I have a person who is armed with a sword. It's a taser sword. It basically is a cutting sword, but when you make contact, it sends 5,000 volts through the sucker. Um, very effective weapon, as, as they say, well, it's a good general effective weapon that we can use until we figure out something else, because in this one, the Dharamuks keep changing the ground troops type. So by now, if you've done all of this, you probably should have most of the really obvious trappings of the parent material shifted over. And you accomplish most of it, most of, most of, sorry, most of this, new lips, I'm breaking my hand. <laughs> uh, most of this with a search and replace command. You haven't even reread the piece yet. Um, now you have heavy lifting to do. You have to fill in the description because we all know what the Enterprise looks like. We all know what, uh, what was it, Sunnydale? The Buffy thing. Uh, we, but we all know these. Everybody who watches the show is aware of what these things look like. Has that setting. But you're doing a unique piece now, so you can no longer just name the setting and leave it to people to fill it in. Now you have the heavy lifting of doing description. This got to offers you an opportunity to change it to suit your uh, to suit your new piece, to add your own style to it, and also you're going to have to describe your characters too. Now this isn't all that onerous. Onerous, sorry. Uh, and, oh, <laughs> Because when you describe a character in fiction, you normally are very, very sparse. If you gave a typical description of a character from a fiction book to a police sketch artist, they'd go, yeah, and? I can't work with this. You know, she was a tall, willowy beauty with long, dark hair and sparkling blue eyes. That's about as much as you get in most cases. Yeah. He was a little ogre of a, ogre of a man, nearly as wide as he was tall. Notice how I made the one unattractive and the man looked like a troll. <laughs> so, you have to add that description because, again, your new readers don't have that. Your new readers don't have that pre preconceived. They look like this actor. And you don't want to keep it too close to the actor, because again, that's another point of distance. Um, difference. Um, change hair color. That's a pretty meaningless change. If you feel it's appropriate, change race. Like, okay, another thing is, okay, a bar becomes a coffee house. You have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of the setting? If the purpose of the setting is just to have a place for them to meet and talk, then change that too, because it makes it more unique and you can add your own nuance to it. You also have the heavy lifting of backstory. 
go, you go in, real honest, this is a new piece. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about your characters. They may love um, Iron Man. They may be passionately fond of Tony Stark. But you're not writing Tony Stark. You're writing Bill Montgomery. So you have got to build backstory for them. Now, in building backstory, you have to ask yourself, how close to the original piece does it have to be for it to dovetail? You don't need Bill Montgomery to be captured by terrorists and housed in a cave. That doesn't have to be his call to action. His call to action could be a couple of superheroes were duking it out and caused a building to collapse on a woman he loved. So he decided that he was going to put his huge technical skills to work and that he was going to become a super vigilante who uh, only attacked super, who attacked both superheroes and supervillains if they caused death. If through their carelessness they caused somebody to die, they would be held accountable. It didn't matter whether they were superhero or supervillain. Which is also a heck of a story idea when you think about it. Streamline your characters. Look for superfluous characters. In a lot of shows, they'll have characters that they're either developing, coming, bringing into development, or that they've had and they no longer serve much of a purpose. Look for superfluous characters and see what you can combine. Keep the number of your main characters as low as possible because you want to have time for everybody to invest in all those characters. And when you are doing it, stay true to your character speech pattern. You may have noticed that I occasionally stumble over words. That's typical of me. Uh, it's worse because I've had about four hours sleep in the last 36. <laughs> so, uh, but that is typical of me. And if you were writing me as a character, you'd want to include that. Uh, you want to keep consistent to that the character in your head's speech pattern. And again, this is, can be a tricky part because you go back to that thing about catchphrases. If one of the things they say is kinda, and that is a catchphrase for the particular character that you're we're drawing from, you might want to change it and get, go with something more consistent. Uh, just a general note about uh, writing, by the way. All forms of writing, original and fanfic and anything else. Turn, when you have it done, turn on your search and replace command. Enter the word suddenly. Go through, read each sentence with it and without it, and then, if it's not pulling weight, delete it. You will find that nine out of ten times, you delete it. You do the same thing with very, you do the same thing with finally, and there's going to be a few others that you're going to find on your own. Another thing to do, and uh, this is again for any kind of writing, but it's a general note. Uh, in the book New Kikubai, when I had that in rough draft, I had, I was editing it, and then I went out and I said, okay, I seem to be, when I uh, speak, I tend to use okay a lot. And one time in a half hour swim class, I used to be a lifeguard swim instructor, I used the word okay 106 times. Somebody was counting. So I went in and I put okay into the search and replace command. And there were over a thousand incidences of it in this one book, which is about 80,000 words. And I just went, okay. Yes, I did. <laughs> but then I went through, and 
I removed OK from every character, character's speech except my lead, Ray McAndrews. He still used OK, and he overuses OK. But I took it out from every other character except for one incident where it was just what any 20th century person would say. Uh, and this person, it, they, that's the only incident in the book where somebody else says okay. But by doing this, it became part of his speech configuration. And if somebody sees, as they're reading through, and they see okay, they know it's free speaking. And you do the same thing with fanfic. That's just a good thing to do with any of your character dialogue, that you set up words that are unique to that character. It adds character, 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 and it makes it come a little bit more alive. And people do it. We all have words that are habitual that we use. OK? <laughs> um, now you start from the beginning. Yes, after all that, you start from the beginning. Technology. If you knocked her down the technology, you have to go, go through and see that it is consistent. If you have given them nanobots, let's say. Well, if you have nanobots, it just follows. And if you have nanobots and they are cheap, plentiful, and available, it just follows that they're going to have a lot of applications. Uh, in a book that I'm trying to market right now, I have nanowalks available, so when they do laundry, they take their clothing, put it in the machine, and the machine says, uh, repair cotton needed for, uh, for cycle. Add the repair cotton into the thing, and the nanowalks remove all the dirt, repair the fibers, and the, and the stuff comes out perfectly pressed and all done. Uh, laundry as we know it no longer happens because that's how the technology would be applied. So uh, if you change your tech, well, tech level, make sure that you follow the logical consequences of that. Be cognizant of all the details that <coughs> flow out of your new environment. Um, as you read through, make sure the characters fit with the new story flow. If you have somebody Okay, let's say you're doing a romantic relationship and you have 20 years between the ages of the protagonists. Well, back in the 1500s, the general, as long as the woman was younger than the man, the attitude would have been, yeah, so. You can't set that set a story where this is a social issue back that far. It's not until you start getting through to the 1900s that a 20-year age difference, as long as the woman is younger, uh, yes, it's sexist, but it's how history goes. I don't necessarily agree with it. <laughs> um, it's not until you get to the 1900s that that becomes a tensor that you can use in the story. So as you're changing, you have to be aware of that and how the world around affects the characters. <laughs> the, what the goal is to salvage the work and make it your own. We write fanfic for love. Bring that same love to your own work. Uh, it's best to keep tight-lipped about the original source material unless you've done some pretty major changes. <clears throat> if you've changed 30% or more of the original source material, as long as you avoid the names and uh, clearly recognizable things, you're covered. And also, expect people to be far more critical of your original work than they are of your fanfic. Now, you're moving into the big leagues. So, when you are sending this to an online writers group, expect them to tear apart. Expect people to be much more critical of this new original piece than they were of its origin fic. Um, now the mechanics. 
You can't take sections of a, of a fanfic, a, a great scene that you've written, and splice it in if it seems appropriate. Uh, one that I'm marketing right now, I took uh, the conclusion of one of the dramatic cycles from a fanfic and used it as my opening conflict. Uh, and it's a fight scene. I like to think it's a good, good fight scene. So I manipulated it and put it in. And then it became the jumping off point. Um, I think that's that. That's really good for sex scenes. Now, after you've written enough sex scenes, they're boring. I'm sorry. They are boring to write. Slot tab A into t uh, junction B. Turn 180 degrees. Boring. So you get to a point where you just want to cut, paste, change the names. Fine, you cut the rocks off. <laughs> Let's get on with the story now. Uh, and the interesting thing with that is you can take this very mechanical sex scene, prop it in, and then as you read through, you can make that interesting now because you're flowing the narrative of the story that you're working on, and you stop, drop, start dropping in the emotion. You start dropping in the character exposition. Because the beauty of the sex scene is not in the mechanics. Uh, there's a story of a group of writers who were hired by a patron in the 1800s to write sex scenes, but not to put any emotion in, to just do the mechanics. And at the end, they wrote their patron and said, Dear patron, we hate you. <laughs> and explained why. So when you start mixing that emotion, because you're never more vulnerable than when you're making love. You're never more open. So it's great, dramatically speaking. But you've got to get mechanics out of the way. And that's what you can look from your fanfic most effectively. And then it's done with, and you can do something interesting. Have some ice cream you're done. <laughs> Respect the original creator who, who obviously gave a work, gave your work that you obviously loved, that touched you in some way. Try to live up to the best that they did. And that means taking time, it means following your own creative muse. Uh, I'm going to say this a little out of sequence, but <coughs> Michael J. Straczynski, does anybody know who he is? Okay. He was the creator of Babylon 5. J. Michael J. Michael Straczynski, sorry, yes. Um, creator of Babylon 5, which I think is probably the best science fiction that's ever been, but that's me. Um, <coughs> he, it, I'm quoting him here, well, paraphrasing a little. Bad writers borrow from other writers. Good writers steal from others. What he meant by that was, a bad writer takes a concept but doesn't make it their own, does not incorporate it, and breathe their own life into it. A good writer takes full possession of the concept, digests it, and puts it out again, but it's original because it's been filtered through the lens of their nature. And this is what you want to do when converting the fanfic. You want to take that concept, digest it entirely, and then bring it out as something new and fresh. And that doesn't mean changing every single word of it, but it means knowing what you need to change to make it your own.